Your ability to understand market structure is directly linked to making good trading decisions and as a result, making money in any market. If you're currently on YouTube trying to looking for a perfect indicator that never loses, I can tell you right away that you won't find one. Just as you can't expect to be a good doctor or lawyer without studying, the same thing is true for trading. You need to put in the work and really take your time to learn. Because how can we expect to make money from trading if we don't know how markets move? So what I plan to do now is to make a long market structure trading course. And in today's video, chapter one, we will go over some of the most important and fundamental aspects of market structure. We will talk about the fundamental pattern, a pattern that appears in all markets and is the foundation not only of market structure but technical analysis in general. We will talk about impulsive moves, we will dive deep into pullbacks. So yeah guys, get comfortable, perhaps grab a coffee and a pen and paper and without further ado, let's jump right into it. So let's start this course off by taking a look at a very simple but very powerful concept that is in the heart not only of all market structure analysis but pretty much all technical analysis in general and I'm talking about the fundamental pattern. It has a few different names sometimes it's called the A, B, C, D pattern but what this pattern basically describes is how markets move. Even if we're talking about more elaborate theories like Elliott wave theory or GAN theory, this pattern is basically in the heart of all of these theories. So why is this pattern so important? Well, as I said, it tells us how the market moves on a very basic but fundamental level. So markets tend to move like this. First, we have a relatively sharp move in one direction. In this example, we have a move towards the upside. This move is usually called an impulse or a trend leg. Following this move, we tend to have a move in the opposite direction. This move is not as sharp or as strong, and this is basically where the market rests before the next impulse to the upside. This move is what we call a pullback or retracement. When we mark the moves like I did right here, for example, you know, A, B, C, and D, uh, I might just simply call the first move A, B, I might call the pullback B, C, and so on and so on during this course. But now let's talk about a very important thing that I think a lot of you guys might be, you know, thinking about, and that is why are markets moving like this? And there are a few different explanations. I like to try to explain this from a perspective of one large actor in the market. So think about like a big bank, hedge fund, or another actor with lots of capital. And let's think about how these actors would execute their moves in the market. Well, if you are, let's say, a bank and needs to buy a lot of something, you could, if you want to, just buy everything at once. But this would probably push up the price very, very high up, and that would make it, you know, unnecessarily expensive for you. A smarter way to execute this trade is to buy a little bit, you buy a little bit. When you start to realize that there's not a lot of liquidity and that the market is going up a bit too fast, then you may pause your buying for a bit. And since you have pushed the price up, this can often lead to the price, you know, going back a bit here. Sometimes the B2C move are actually more like a flat move, but many times you will see the market going down and retracing a bit. Perhaps people that bought all the way down here sees this as a good opportunity to take profits and so on and so on. Uh, but after you have seen the price sort of cooling down and we are now once again at, you know, relatively more attractive prices, then you start buying again and so on and so on. And this fundamental pattern or price pulls can be found on all markets and also across all time frames. So let's say that we zoom in on this part right here. You will notice that this impulsive move itself will consist of impulsive moves towards the upside and pullbacks. Impulsive moves towards the upside and pullbacks and so on and so on. And if we zoom in on this part right here, the same thing can be found here. We will have impulsive moves and pullback, 
impulsive moves and pull back and so on and so on and that is because you're of course not alone in the market we have you know hundreds of thousands if not millions of actors buying and selling all the time and that is why this pattern can be found even on very small time frames but as we zoom out we can see that these patterns together creates larger patterns and the larger patterns creates creates even larger patterns and so on and so on and this is what i mean when i say that markets are fractal the word fractal here is basically just a fancy word for saying that parts of a pattern so for example this part right here will resemble the whole pattern so you can see that a part of the pattern looks the exact same way or pretty much the same way as the pattern as a whole and this may feel like a simple concept but this is very important to understand because this is a big reason that for example trading strategies that works on the daily time frame tend to work on the shorter time frames like the one hour time frame as well and the patterns you find on for example the four hour time frame you will also find on the 15 minute time frame and that is because markets are fractal and this is also useful because the concepts you learn in this course can pretty much be applied on all types of time frames and markets because of the nature of how markets behave so now let's dive a little bit deeper into the impulsive moves which is you know for example this move right here and this move right here uh, because we need to understand how do we know that we have an impulsive move or if we have a pullback and so on and so on and impulsive moves can be identified by only looking at the price so one thing to look out for when it comes to impulsive moves is that the candles within this move we want to preferably be you know pretty large and especially what we want to see here is that we want to see the candles during the impulsive move to be, you know, larger and show more momentum compared to the candles in the pullback. Or in very simple terms, we want the price to sort of increase more sharply compared to the pullback. To find impulsive moves, I personally prefer to look at the candles. And this is something that you will only get better and better at with practice. Uh, but you can actually also use indicators to help you identify uh, sort of the best impulsive moves. So now let's take a look at the very first example for this course. As you can see, I have an indicator on the chart. It's a special version of the MACD. And I will talk about the settings I have on the MACD and how to use it very soon. But first, I actually have an exercise for you guys. So this exercise is very simple. I want you guys to look at this chart and see if you can identify impulsive moves and pullbacks. And use what we talked about recently. The impulsive move should be sharper and preferably have larger candles compared to the pullback. So pause the video right here if you want to. All right, so for me, the most uh, obvious impulsive move on this chart is this move right here. And why is that? Well, we can pretty clearly see that this move towards the upside is much sharper compared to the prior pullback. Uh, we can see this uh, in different ways. We can first of all see that the pullback simply is sharper. Uh, it's much more steep. And we can see this in different ways. The first way is to just look at the steepness here. We can see that this move, uh, the impulsive move, is much steeper compared to the previous pullback. Uh, another way to look at this is to simply look at the candles. So we can see that during the impulsive move, we have many sort of large and strong candles here towards the upside, while during the pullback, we have many of these sort of very small uh, candles. They have small bodies, which is the wide part of the candle. Uh, so we can pretty clearly see that this is an impulsive move. But on this chart, I would actually also consider this one as an impulsive move. This one is much harder to see, but this is definitely a sharper sort of increase compared to the previous price movement. However, what makes this a bit harder, in my opinion, is that just before this sort of move started, we actually did have some sort of large black and white candles here. So this can make that impulsive move a bit harder. Uh, but now guys, I do want to switch the attention here and take a look at the indicator. So here on the chart, I have a MACD indicator to open up the MACD. You simply search for MACD in the indicators tab 
in trading view uh, but for this case I actually have some special settings so to change the settings of the MACD you go to the settings tab down here and here you can see that I actually use no histograms and I only use the MACD line and signal line. And to be honest, I don't even need the signal line here. We can only use the MACD. Uh, the MACD is basically a measurement of momentum. And momentum is exactly what we're looking out for when we're looking out for impulsive moves. Momentum is basically a measurement of the sort of speed and velocity of price. And that is exactly what we want to see during impulsive moves. But you can see here for this MACD indicator, I have some special settings. This is the sa same settings that, for example, Adam Grimes use. I use the fast length of three, slow length of 10. We use a signal smoothing of 16, and we use the SMA instead of the EMA as the MA type. Uh, you can, however, you can use the standard MACD settings, but I've found that these settings work very well for me to find these sort of impulsive moves. And how do we use the MACD? to find these moves. So let's start with the most obvious example. In this example, we can see that the MACD clearly prints a higher high compared to the previous high. You can see we have a much higher high right there. This can be used as an indication that this right here is a good impulsive move. For the other example, it's definitely not as obvious as we can see here. Yes, the MACD prints a higher high, so that is a good sign. However, th the difference is not as clear. But this could still uh, be considered, uh, you know, a pretty good impulsive move. But now let's move a bit to the left here. So I want to take a look at this example. If we now take a look at this one right here, now it starts to look a little bit shaky, right? Just by looking at the price, we can see that mm, this one doesn't look as clear at all compared to the previous ones. So that is already a warning sign. Uh, but here, when we look at the MACD, it gets very clear. We can see that here we have a high, but here we print a clearly lower high. So we have the price going in one direction and we have the momentum going in the other direction. This, by the way, is something we call a momentum divergence. And traders often use this as a sign that the following pullback might be something we want to stay away from. In this case, you can actually see that we actually saw a little, little pullback and we got yet another push towards the upside. However, this is not a pullback. I would have traded for the simple reason that the impulsive move before the pullback was not as strong. So yeah, this right here is the foundation for one of the most effective and one of the most common trading strategy. And that is basically to buy pullbacks following good impulsive moves. And we will look at pullbacks in detail very soon. But first I have to talk about a very important complication with this strategy. And that is that yes, in order to find good pullback opportunities, we want to see a strong impulsive move. However, if this move is, you know, too strong and goes on for too long, this can actually be a sign that we're talking about a trend climax. And a trend climax is basically a common way for trends to end. And this is maybe not the best example because after the climax here, we started to go sideways for a while. Uh, one important thing to notice ab about trend climaxes is that many times these climaxes can lead to sharp reversals to the downside. And if you're not careful and don't have proper risk management, these trend climaxes can lead to, you know, very big losses. So we need to be careful, but how do we identify a trend climax? Well, once again, you can find them by simply looking at the price, but you can also use indicators to sort of help you, especially in the beginning. So let's talk about both here. So first of all, uh, currently we're looking at Tesla here on the four hour time frame, and we can see that Tesla has been in an extended uptrend. You can see that during this part we had, you know, we had higher highs, we had higher lows. But from this low, we can see that the price is starting to have more and more shallow pullbacks. We pretty much don't even have pullbacks. The price 
is starting to go up and up and up uh, pretty much in a sort of parabolic fashion. So during this phase, emotional buyers chase the price higher and higher and the slightest speed bump. So if we just start to see the price reversing a bit, this can easily lead to a sort of snowball effect and we can see sharp moves in the opposite direction of the trend. In my opinion, these moves are super hard to trade both on the buy side but also on the sell side because these moves can go on. We don't know how, how long they will go on. They can go on for extended periods of times. But because of the nature of this move, uh, and because we don't really have any clear pullback, it's also very hard to know where to enter and to fi find buying opportunities. And if you are a buyer and are already in this type of move, uh, it can be a good idea to at least start to offload some of your positions, because when we start to really get in a buying frenzy, it can soon sharply reverse to the downside. But now let's talk about the indicator I have here on the chart. To find the indicator, you go to the indicators tab and you simply search for Bollinger Band. I'm using the simple Bollinger Band indicator, this one right here. Um, and this one can sort of help you identify these moves, especially if you are a beginner, this can actually be super useful. Because when we see these sort of parabolic moves, what you usually see on the Bollinger Band is that the price will, first of all, they will trade very near the top of the range. Or in other words, this means that the price is far above uh, its average. And when the trend is, you know, starting to near the end, you will also usually see uh, candlesticks. You can see, for example, these two candlesticks that are completely outside the band. You can see the whole candles here are outside the band. This, by the way, is what we call free bars. So a free bar is when the whole candlestick is outside the band. And that basically means that the candles are way, way above the norm. And this is definitely a warning sign or at least a sign of caution if you are in this trade. So now we have been talking quite a bit about the impulsive moves, but something that is at least as important is to understand pullbacks. So let's dive a little bit deeper into pullbacks or in other words, retracements. Yet another word here is consolidations. And I think that consolidations is a word that describes pullbacks pretty well. Because the pullback is basically a period where the price needs to sort of consolidate the energy from the preceding impulsive move. And when we see a clean pullback like we have right here, simply just a line in the opposite direction, this is what we call a simple pullback. But unfortunately, it's not always this easy because many times you will see pullbacks that looks more something like this. And this is what we call a complex pullback. And complex pullbacks are vital to understand because it's very rare that we see perfect trends where you know all the pullbacks are simple pullbacks. It's much more common that we have trends that sort of alternate between complex pullbacks, simple pullbacks, complex pullbacks, and so on and so on. Later on in this course, I will start talking about concepts like major and minor structure. And complex pullbacks are a very sort of simple example of a minor structure. A minor structure is basically the small structures within the larger trend. So now let's switch the attention and talk a little bit about pullbacks and Fibonacci. And if the word Fibonacci sounds scary, don't worry at all, this is actually pretty simple. The Fibonacci is basically a tool to analyze the depth of the pullback. So we use the Fibonacci to basically analyze how deep is the pullback compared to the impulsive move. And most of the times the pullback here will be around maybe 50% of the impulsive move or to use a broader range it will be you know at least in between 25 percent to 75 percent and we have a tool here in trading view called fibonacci retracement which basically analyzes this for us and to open up the fibonacci tool we go up here to the upper left corner we click on gan and fibonacci tool and you will have the fibonacci retracement here at the top 
And how do we draw our Fibonacci to analyze the depth of the pullback? Well, what we do is that we anchor the Fibonacci at the lowest point of the impulsive move, and then we drag the Fibonacci up to the highest point of the impulsive move. So we anchor from the swing low to swing high. And then the Fibonacci, you can see we have different levels here. One is called 0.382, and the next one 0.5, the next one 0.618. This is basically percentages. So 0.382 simply means 38.2%, and 0.618 basically means 61.8%. And these numbers come from something called the Fibonacci sequence, and the mathematics is not too important. The important thing here is that we can use this tool to find areas on the chart where the pullbacks are most likely to reverse. So remember what I said recently, I said that you know most of the pullbacks will end here in between 25% to maybe 75%. Um, however, most traders prefer to use the Fibonacci range, which is basically the range here in between the 0.618 or 62% to 0.382 or 38%. So a good rule of thumb you can use when you analyze pullbacks is that this range right here is a common area for the price to reverse and continue the next impulsive move. So now I have another short exercise for you guys. I'm currently looking at Bitcoin on the daily time frame, and this is a pretty extreme example because this was the Bitcoin bull run that started in late 2020. But what I want you guys to do is to look at this trend right here, identify the impulsive moves and the pullbacks, and then use the Fibonacci tool and see how many of these pullbacks reversed in the range between the 0.618 and the 0.382. So pause the video and do this if you want to. But now let's take a look. First, let's identify the trend here. We have a massive impulsive move right here. This is almost looking like a climax, by the way. As I said, this is a pretty extreme example, uh, but we had an impulse move, we had a pullback, we had a next strong impulsive move and a pullback. We had yet another impulsive move and a pullback. And at this point, the trend is starting to look, you know, the impulses is not looking that good anymore. So this is a you know, time we might start to get more cautious, but let's use it at the clear uh, uptrend right here. So let's use our Fibonacci tool. Remember, we anchor from the low to the swing low to the swing high. And we can see here that the first pullback reversed in this area. Let's take a look at the next one, swing low to swing high. We can see that the next one also reversed in this area. Once again, swing low to swing high. And in this case, we can see that barely, but the price just touched the 0.618 level uh, and then the price reversed once again. So for the same reason that pullbacks tends to be around 50%, of the impulsive move. Another very useful rule of thumb is that the impulsive moves itself, so this move and this move, tends to be, you know, roughly the same length. And this is why traders often use something called a measured move objective to take targets when they enter a trade. So for example, let's say that a trader that is trading pullbacks entered around here. So, so the entry point was right here. A common way to take targets is to measure the move. So they measure the impulsive move. They take this measurement right and measure from the low. So a target level for this pullback trader could be up here. And this style of measuring impulsive moves, take an entry and then use that measurement to take targets is something you will see a lot in technical analysis. For example, when we talk about chart patterns, the target level will often be some kind of measurement of the move that happened before the pattern appeared. Another common level to take targets is to take targets around the highest point of the impulsive move. And this is basically because this right here is a very important spot and it's a level that lots of traders are paying attention to because if the price breaks above then we are officially in the next impulsive move however if we fail to break this level right here this could be a strong sign 
of a reversal. You can, for example, see that if we reverse exactly at that point, we print a sort of double top pattern. So that is why many traders will use this level, many times setting it just a bit below uh, the previous high, so perhaps somewhere around here. And many times they will take some of their position of the table at this point, or all of it. Many times it will depend on the price action. So how does the price react to that level? So now we have talked a little bit about how to trade pullbacks, but now I actually want to give you guys a few specific rules that makes pullbacks more likely to succeed. And first of all, right now I'm looking at Bitcoin, but on two different time frames. So here to the left, you have the four hour time frame, and to the right, we have the daily time frame. And I want you all to first look here at the four hour time frame. As you guys can see, we have a pretty clean looking downtrend here in the short term. The impulsive moves are looking pretty strong and good. So this is a scenario where you might consider to go short, right? And bet that the market will continue to go down. You can see we have a nice impulsive move towards the downside right here. And now we are in a downtrend. So this right here is the pullback. But if we switch the attention now to the daily time frame, we need to take a very close look at where we are on the daily. And the chart to the left here is basically this part to the right. And as you can see on the daily time frame, Bitcoin is actually in a very clear uptrend. So we need to ask ourselves, is this really a place where we want to short the market at the very low of a pullback in an uptrend? And the answer here is no. To improve your win rates trading pullbacks and trading in general, it's very important to consider multiple timeframes. And this is something we will talk about more later on in this course. Uh, but now I do wanna switch the attention here to this chart. So remember from earlier in this video, in order to have nice pullbacks with a high win rate, first of all, we want the pullback to follow good momentum. So this right here is a good example of a pullback coming after good momentum. And one could actually argue that we have a little three candle pullback right here as well. You can, for example, look down here to the MACD and see that even for this small pullback, we actually printed a new momentum high. So this right here was definitely a potential trade. We have a larger pullback right here, which is also a potential trade. Uh, we can see that the MACD printed a higher high once again. Yet another higher high was printed right here. And as you can see, we saw a good momentum move, this time followed by a very large pullback. And I can also just show you guys the measured move here. So if we traded these pullbacks and used our measured move techniques, the first target of the first pullback would be around here, not a too bad target, a little before the pullback ended. And the next measured move would look, some, would look something like this. We measure from the low to high. We take this measurement, measure from the low of the pullback. And you can see that once again, this was a pretty damn good target, to be honest. So the measure moves worked out fine here. But now let's take a look at the next momentum move. So is this right here a good momentum? Well, first of all, just by looking at the candles, we can see that this move right here is not really much stronger than the pullback. And we can get confirmation by looking at the indicator. So we see that the indicator actually now prints a lower high. So in this case, we have a divergence between momentum and the price. And this is a rule I want you guys to remember that entering a pullback after a momentum divergence is most of the time something we want to avoid. Another thing you want to look out for that we already have mentioned is that we want the pullback to end somewhere in this area, preferably. Uh, you can see in this case, the first small three candle pullback uh, just barely dipped into this area. So this is an indication that we are in a pretty strong trend as of that point. Uh, the next pullback, let's take a look at the next pullback. In this case, we can see that it was pretty deep. We went down all the way to the 0 0.618, but it's still within that range. However, I do think the last pullback here, this is starting to become a warning sign for sure. You can see that this pullback went below 
the 0.7 line right here. So even though we had a good impulsive move before the pullback, this pullback is getting a little bit too deep to be optimal. So yeah guys, it's actually time to wrap up chapter 1 right here. Hopefully after watching this video, you have a better understanding of pullbacks, impulsive moves, and basically how markets move in general. I think that after this chapter, we have a great sort of basic understanding to dive deeper into market structure. We are just getting started here. But yeah guys, if you don't want to miss the upcoming episodes, make sure to, you know, subscribe, hit that notification bell and all that good stuff. And of course, if you did like this video, it would be super, super awesome and helpful if you show that by dropping a like. I look forward to continuing this course. If you have any questions, make sure to drop them down below. I will try my very best to answer every single one. But yeah, when chapter two is out, the video will be up on the screen right here. I hope to see you guys in chapter two really soon.